Hey YouTube, thanks for stopping by. This is Matthew with the Counselors Guild. And today I got some sad news uh, in the psychology world. Aaron T. Beck passed away at 100. Uh, the father of cognitive theory, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, tight in the industry, um, lived to be 100. Um, and uh, he passed away today. So it was uh, sad to hear. He's my favorite therapist or theorist, and uh, you know his theory has helped me understand human behavior. And um, as far as you know, understanding human behavior and how I can help people, uh, I use his theory often. Um, it makes the most sense to me, and and you know, sad to see that the uh, the creator passed away. Uh, I figured today uh, we can look at his theory. Uh, and kind of talk about it for a little bit and understand it a little bit better. So we're going to be looking at Aaron T. Beck's cognitive theory. Okay, and it, I put the picture with his daughter, that's Judith Beck. Uh, she's very important and instrumental in the developing, maintaining, and you know the future of cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, she runs the Beck Institute, and she's a very important person uh, when we talk about cognitive theory and cognitive behavioral therapy. All right, so let's get into it. So let's start off with the schema. Now, the schema is something you probably heard from Jung. Um, it's a lot, I think it's used a lot in psychoanalyst or a psychodynamic model. Uh, now, Aaron Beck, he was a trained psychoanalyst, went to school for it, and practiced it for uh, a while until he created his own theory. So Aaron T. Beck's idea of the schema, let's talk about that. Now, first it says, now Beck says the Schema is the most general, highest order level of cognition. A schema holds specific core beliefs and assumptions. The core beliefs about the person and, how, and the assumptions they make about the world. A core belief is an unconditional belief about the self, others, or the world. An assumption is a conditional belief, often in the form of either an if-then proposition or a rule of living. So it's conditional because if something happens, then that's going to happen. You know, it's not like that. The core belief is different because it's it's there is no if then. You know, it's just is. You know, um, I'm a bad person. There's no if this happens, then I'm a bad person. The un, you know that's the difference between core beliefs and assumptions. Okay. However, the core beliefs drives the assumptions. You know, if you have a, a core belief that I'm a bad person, you know. If I get broken up with, then it must be my fault because I'm a bad person. You see how that kind of uh, works together? Um, a schema, I'm on my the third one down, um, is hypothesized to be a general cognitive structure in which experiences, memories, thoughts, attitudes, and beliefs connected with a cluster of generalized meanings gather. So, uh, and you can kind of look at like early development. Maybe if you look at Eric Erickson's uh, first stage of basic trust, mistrust. If somebody developed on a mistrust, you know, how is that going to develop their schema? You know, and this is no if then. This is this is unconditional. You know, um, so if they they grow up with a basic mistrust of the world, you know, how is that going to affect their schema? You know what I'm saying? What's gonna? How is that gonna affect their assumptions? You know, what are they gonna assume about the world? Um, so the schema is developed through experiences, memories, thoughts, attitudes, and beliefs. Okay. Beck believes that schemas, core beliefs, and assumptions are seen as part of the vulnerability factor that predisposes clients to be triggered into negative symptoms and psychological problems such as depression and anxiety. Um, Beck was, he focused on depression and anxiety, uh, and most of his books look at depression or anxiety. I have a couple of them. Um, but if you look at the vulnerability factor, what type of schema does a person have to develop throughout their life to where they're more vulnerable to depression or anger or anxiety? 
that's that's kind of where the schema comes into place and, and why he kind of needs a schema because it need, he needs to know where these symptoms are coming from you know tracing it back to something and I think that's the schema is like the end point you can trace it back all the way back in the schema there's nothing beyond that you know um, life events trigger these latent negative behaviors and this often results in self-maintaining I'm sorry in a self-maintaining vicious cycle of negative thoughts emotion and behavior patterns so cycles very important when it comes to cognitive theory um, this is what Beck noticed when he was working as a psychoanalyst these people would come in with depression and he would notice a, a cycle uh, or, or uh, he would notice a pattern with these people's thinking and that's what made him want to create his own cognitive theory schemas can be good or bad the content of schemas is less conscious you don't really know I mean think think about why you're thinking away this way you know you're not really I don't know well that's kind of tough to think about um, but you're, you're not conscious of it and specific uh, than that of automatic thought. Schema development may be related to early, even very early experience, and because of this, may have been encoded, not been encoded in language. The schema concept helps to explain both the consistencies in people's reactions to events and the differences in the way different people respond to the same event. Everybody has a different schema, kind of like the theory of mind two people experience the same exact um, event but they have different interpretations of it you know, one interprets it bad one interprets it's good you know, it's the schema that's driving that next up automatic negative automatic thoughts okay from the beliefs and assumptions of the schema um, I don't know why that's there it shouldn't be there but don't focus on those small words there I don't know why that's there Negative automatic thoughts from the beliefs and assumptions from the schema. Okay, conditional. All right. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Okay. These are conditional. These are based on a condition. Um, try to think about being an autopilot. You know, when you're on autopilot, you're not really consciously thinking about everything, right? You learn how to deal with something, and, and, and you just do that for the rest of your life. Okay. Um, trying to think about where I was going with that. <laughs> um, but anyway, let me move on to the second point. I'll, I'll get back to that. Uh, Beck identified multiple negative automatic thoughts. Beck began to notice specific themes that varied according to the problem area being presented. Presented. Depressed clients, for example, reported NATs with a characteristic theme of loss and defeat. Anxious clients, however, reported NATs that showed a preoccupation with impending danger or threat. Hostile and angry clients reported thoughts showing a preoccupation with transgression and injustice. Now, if you imagine yourself on auto autopilot, your mind is always going to take the path, the path of least resistance. Okay, It's always going to use those thoughts that worked the last time okay so if something happened to me and I'm preoccupied with danger and threats and become anxious well it's because that's what I used before and now I'm just using it again and then again and again you use it throughout your life until you have a therapist come in and say alright we gotta change that cycle up okay that that vicious cycle that we were talking about earlier we gotta change that okay we gotta stop these automatic thoughts we gotta take you off autopilot and we need to consciously put in positive automatic thoughts okay I think that's what they're called <laughs> or they could just be alternative thoughts um, in order for you not feel anxious and not be depressed okay but negative automatic thoughts are really important for his theory um, this is what he noticed in those clients and this is what led him to develop his own theory um, this and this is uh, the third point down, the cognitive content specificity hypothesis. Certain people think a certain way. Holds an important place in this theory and practice of cognitive therapy because it drives the therapist interventions. I'm not going to use interventions for that were created for depressed people, for anxious people, because they have a different way of thinking. 
Okay. The depressed are more focused on loss and defeat. Or yeah. And anxious people are more about impending doom and danger and threats. Uh, so different theories or different different interventions are gonna be used. Okay. And I'll talk about that later. Never mind. Beck considers the nature of NATs. They are negative because they tend to result in negative emotions and actions from the person who has them. So positive automatic thinking will create a positive emotion and probably put you on a path towards, I'm thinking about the action part, a positive emotion will put you on a path towards more productive action or a different way of dealing with that situation. Uh, and that's going to be the behavior part, right? When cognitive behavioral therapy, changing your thinking and then your behavior. Um, they're automatic because they typically seem to come from very quickly to the mind without conscious effort. So again, on autopilot. You use these. The mind, the mind is lazy. You know why? Because it has to do so much. It, it's not. It, it's lazy in the sense that it has so much to do, it tries to create things simpler. Okay? So if they learned a certain way of thinking in the past and that worked, they're going to keep doing it over and over again. You know, even though the, you know, the, the situation may have, may have changed just a little bit, but it's, com it's common enough to where I just have to think a certain way. You know, I'm going to do that for everything. Okay, it's a path of least resistance is the, what the mind will always take. And that's usually the automatic, the autopilot, what worked before will work again kind of thing. And, and that's how you get in those vicious cycles. Okay, and that's what you have to break. Uh, cognitive therapy has increasingly adopted the stress, I'm going to mess this up, diathesis uh, model of causality. Causality. Yeah, that's going to be a tough one. I'm going to do a, a slide on that next. So let's look at what the stress dialysis model of causality is. And, and I'm going to say it wrong, but that's okay. Beck's concept of psychopathology has the nature of the stress dialysis diathesis or a stress vulner, stress or vulnerability concept now he didn't create this this was already created but he used it in his theory because he wants to show where cognitive how cognitions could be a problem for people okay so such a model acknowledges the etiology of such complicated human human problems depression is likely multi-casual multi-casual factors are likely to be many but may be conveniently grouped into two main categories. Stressors, current life events that act as triggers, or underlying vulnerabilities. Now he put his cognitive uh, factors in the underlying vulnerability. That's where the scheme is gonna come in, okay? Underlying factors were likely to include socioeconomic factors, physiology, health and genetics, as well as cognitive factors, okay? So he needs to use this because he's showing that this person has anxiety due to cognitive factors, or this person has anxiety due to um, uh, health declining. They got cancer, so they're more anxious or they're more depressed. Okay, it doesn't necessarily always have to be cognitive factors. So that's what um, this model is trying to say, and um, he uses this model um, to place his idea of cognitive factors that may be causing these mental health problems. Underlying factors, oh, I'm sorry, I read that, so one, two, three, fourth one down, schematic triggering may be promoted by associations with early traumatic experiences or uh, by sensations, touch, sound, smell, and by language. A re-stimulation effect is seen as a bottom-up effect that comes surging up from the underlying factors and suffuses itself to the current reaction overloading it with unmanageable negative feelings and symptoms. Okay. All right, so that's the stress diathesis model of causality. That's a tough, that's, that's, that's a tough, tough thing to say. Uh, all right, so let's look at the variety of levels, kind of like how Freud has the, the, un, the, the unconscious, pre-conscious, conscious. He's got these different levels too. Um, so the cognitive theory stipulates three cognitive systems or levels. You got the preconscious, the unintentional, the automatic. You got the conscious level, 
and you got the metaconscious level. The speed at which they pass through the mind means that they often evade immediate critical review, autopilot. Okay, We're not critically thinking about everything that happens to us. If we did, my gosh, how long, I don't even know, that would be crazy, right? We have to be on autopilot for most things, okay? But sometimes it, we get into negative autopilot thoughts. I mean, it's just, it just happens. Um, so we have to rely on autopilot um, in order to, to not think about things all day, every day, and, and not have time for anything else. Um, so we have to rely on autopilot for a lot of things. But sometimes it can be bad. Um, so pre-conscious, unintentional, automatic. Uh, that's probably where your um, schema will be. Um, the conscious level, I mean, you're more aware. And then the meta-conscious level is, of course, thinking about your conscious uh, thoughts. Core beliefs are sometimes compared to the root of a tree. So kind of visualize in the ground, you know, buried. Uh, hard to get to, not really seen, not really aware, con uh, unconscious of, right, or pre-conscious is how they say. Um, and then you got, you know, the, the trunk kind of growing up. Those are the intermediate beliefs. And then you got the branches, the assumptions, and then leaves are the automatic thoughts. Um, so in order to change, you know, this is where therapy comes in, in order to change somebody's anxious thinking, Sometimes you have to start at the leaves and you work your way down. Um, over practice, over time, and with practice, you can go down. Okay, that's why there's a lot of homework assignments. That's a lot of uh, um, tables you fill out uh, for cognitive behavioral therapy because you're starting at the leaves and you're trying to get down to the roots. It's going to take some time. Okay, and plus you're thinking you're talking about 20, 40 years of a, you know your cognitive tree. You know, it takes time to change how you think and restructure that. Uh, but that's a good, I think, a good, um, like, image to try, try to think about his theory, you know, where the scheme is in the ground and then depending on how your scheme develops, it, it grows into this tree, okay? Uh, changing different types of cognitions does tend to require different types of cognitive restructuring. Um, okay. Okay. I don't know why I put that there, but next one. Cognitive distortions, okay? So these are some of those general um, ways people were thinking. Uh, Beck came up with some of these, and also Judith Beck came up with some of these. If you Google cognitive distortions, I'm sure you'll probably find 20, 30 of them. But these were, these were Beck's here. Um, this is the ones, and you can tell which ones are for anxiety and which ones are for depression. Overgeneralization. The client typically describes a higher ratio of his experiences as negative than what they really are. Right? Depressed people tend to think that way. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, arbitrary inference. The client typically latches onto one particular negative view of her situation. Depression, right? Um, so selective abstraction. The, cl the client typically picks out one negative slice of information, ignores other more positive factors. Depression. <laughs> Tunnel vision. The client typically focuses on a very narrow range of factors that are likely to confirm his negative overall view. They're just focused on the negative stuff. When you just focus on the negative things, like a breakup, Oh man, she's out of my life. I'm never gonna see her again. You know, All right, well, what's the positive side? You know, what, hey, is, you know, there's more fish out there. You know, it's time to get your act together. You know, get to the gym, work out. You know, get, you know, get get yourself together, and then maybe go out there and find another person. You know, who knows? But again, this is these are kind of distortions we have that lead us into a cycle of anxiety and depression. Black and white thinking. The client typically pushes neutral gray information into the category of negative. Okay. <clears throat> Should statements. Now him, Beck and Ellis were. I don't think, I don't think they're rivals. I think they were. They just had different ideas, you know. And Ellis is kind of a character. Uh, I remember he's 
remember in grad school, I used to, they used to say, like, he used to say, don't should yourself, you know, or don't masturbate. Uh, those are some of his uh, irrational thoughts. Um, but should statements, the client typically has self rules which demand high and perfectionist standards from herself, so anxiety, right? Um, but should and must are, are irrational. I, I think they can be irrational because it, it, you're trying to say you know how the world works and how the thing should be or must be. Well, they're not always going to be that way. You know, the world don't work that way. Uh, so what's going to happen when they don't? You know, get angry, get anxious. You know? So should and must don't be. You don't want them in your category of of words. Um, any any type of absolute word like never or always. Also, some words you don't you don't want to use because it can lead to you know a distortion of reality and lead to negative feelings. Um, so I, I try to use this personally. I try to stay away from absolutes. Um, nothing's always or not never happens. Never say never. You know. Anyway, let's move on to magical thinking. The client typically imagines that his badness is transparent to all. Catastrophizing. The client typically over-exaggerates the potential dangers existing in everyday situations. Anxiety. Labeling. The client typically accentuates negative aspects of the situation or person by attaching a stereotypical negative label to them. That could be anxiety. I could see depression too. Uh, it can be useful to distinguish them because some clients do seem to have favorite distortions. It seems, however, more useful to try to use simplified versions of distortion where main themes are identified. Now, that's important for, as a therapist, you're going to want to identify. That's where your intervention is going to come in at. Beck stresses that it is actually belief change that leads to therapeutic change, implying that a process of modifying thoughts begins to alter the higher order, which is your schema, of which they are outcropped. Kind of the cognitive distortions. Metacognition, are important for his theory. This is where change comes in at. A therapist can't reach into your brain and change how you think. You have to do it yourself. But you have to be aware of your thinking. And metacognition is the way people think about thinking. Also influences the way they feel and behave. If you look at, let me see, I tried to pull it up earlier. This little box here, uh, I don't know, top right here. It's, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but it says situations, and it has an arrow and thoughts, feelings, behaviors, physical reactions. See this? Okay. The situation, you don't have any control over. That's the environment. Okay. Nothing you can do about it. It's going to happen. The thoughts. Well, right now you're on autopilot. Okay. But over time, with help, you will begin metacognition to where you're thinking about your thinking. Something happens... And instead of autopilot, you take yourself off autopilot and you start gaining control because you, you're going to, if you think a different way, you're going to feel a different way. Right? If, you break, if someone breaks up with you, if your thinking is, I'll never find anyone, I'll be alone forever, no one loves me, how is that going to make you feel? It'll make you feel bad, right? How are you going to behave when you feel bad? Okay, and over time, physical reactions, you know, with blood, less energy, lethargic. Um, and, I mean, it doesn't go in a cycle. It's not, um, what's it called? Not just one way. It's all over. Like, you can, I mean, what happens if, uh, say, for instance, you said something, you didn't mean, you know, and someone took it the wrong way, and now they're, they don't like you anymore. And your behavior, you know, changes maybe your thoughts. You know, maybe you think, oh. Man, I should have said that. I feel bad now. And now you feel guilty, you know? Um, so I like how the arrows are pointed all over the place because, um, you know, one thing leads to the other. But the thoughts, this is where cognitive therapy comes in, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, well, cognitive for thoughts and behavior would be down here. Um, but you're changing. You're trying to change both of those. Because your feelings are really at the mercy of... of uh, something you never really start feeling 
don't know. That's 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 interesting. That something could happen in your environment to where you feel before you think or behave. I don't know if that's possible. Because you thinking drives how you feel, right? You can behave a certain way to make you feel that way. But I'm pretty sure feeling is at the mercy of your thoughts. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> That's tough. I never thought about that, but uh, maybe that should be a different video. I should look into researching that. But anyway, but you see how the your thoughts are right here? So metacognition is going to come in. Whoops. Uh, that's the back um, and it, it's gonna help you become aware of your thinking become aware of these negative automatic thoughts these cognitive distortions you can't change anything unless you become aware of them right um, it is the ability for the individual to both think about our thinking and to apply that's good a cognitive process such as memory and attention to our thinking it's one of the highest levels of thought only humans can do it. No other animal can do this. Reflective thinking, for example, allows us to gain distance from and override our negative thoughts. Okay. For example, worry. And this is the third point down here. Worry can maybe positive. Okay. Now I read some books. I think it was an ACT book about worry, and they say it's kind of a worthless behavior because it gets nothing done. Okay. I, I agree with you. But for this example, worry may be positive. If I worry a lot about this, I will find a solution. Positive, right? The positive is finding a solution. Most time, worry doesn't lead to solution. Most, most time, worry leads to more anxiety. Okay, That's why the ACT book on worry... What was that called, anyway? I don't remember. Hang on a second. The worry trap. That's what it's called, the worry trap. I think I did a video on that. I don't know if I did. Um, the worry trap is basically don't worry, problem solve. <laughs> you know, um, but this one right here, if I worry a lot about this, I'll find a solution. Okay. Or negative, if I worry like this, I'll go mad. Well, because you're not looking for a solution. And uh, that's basically what the worry, worry trap is all about. Um, but anyway, but you see, if you become more aware of if I'm worrying, I need to find a solution, then I won't go mad. You know, so you have to be, you got to be aware of that. If it, you're auto, if you're on autopilot and something happens to lead you to worry, you just get worry, worry, worry until, oh, something happened to where it makes the worry go away. You know, you didn't do anything about that. Just the environment changed to where you don't worry about it anymore. You know, something like that. So metacognition is really important for cognitive theory as far as wanting to change. Um, so, metacognition. Oh, wait, let me go back to my presentation mode. Here we go. Practice of cognitive therapy. So if you go to cognitive behavioral therapy, that's just cognitive, but most people don't do just cognitive. Usually it's cognitive behavioral. Um, well, I guess there could be some ther therapist out there. I don't know any, but there might be. Um, but this is what, what they do here. Effective cognitive therapists. This is what Beck thinks. Um, and this is from a book. Oh, man. It, I think it's a Beck. I don't know where my bag is. But it's a it's a Aaron Beck book on cognitive theory. Um, you can Amazon it. There's, there's tons of different books from him. Uh, any of those would probably say the same thing. Effective cognitive therapists should be formulating all the time. Formulation is unique to Beck. He was the first one to do that. Formulation. Okay. You have, I've listened to you. This is just an example. I've listened to my client for two sessions and I found out a pattern. Okay. Um, I found out they, they overgeneralize. Okay. Which is, you know, negative, right? Depression. Okay. So I'm going to formulate my intervention based off that information. Okay, that's what Beck brought to the, the whole um, game here. You know, that's his biggest contribution is formulation. Well, I mean, cognitive behavioral therapy is pretty darn big, but formulation was his, you know, that was the first, I think it was the first one to do that. Okay, 
Um, and he made he made therapy structured. You know, it's not just t- talking and and and, and um, free association. You know, it's just, you're getting it, it. It's planned out. You know, it makes sense. You know, there's an end. Of, there's an end to all this. Where free association, psychoanalysts, it's just. Who knows? You know, I just I, I like things mapped out. Maybe that's why I was drawn to his theory so so much. Is I like things mapped out to where I can see I can see the problem, know the solution, and work on applying that solution to the person's life so that they don't have to think that way anymore, or they don't have to feel that way anymore, you know, or act that way anymore, you know. But he was the first one to use formulation. Um, but anyway, uh, first point, effective cognitive therapist should be formulating all the time as he or she collects cognitive data. The therapist is like a detective who has a lot of cues, clues, but still not solve the crime. As the cognitive clues are fitted together, it should slowly become clear what the target areas are and even what might be the best ways of addressing them. Formulations are helpful not only in guiding and understanding, of the client's situation, but also in guiding how therapeutic work should be aimed at targeting key elements of the formulation. So it's no, it's, it's his theory, and why it's, I think it's so much better than Freud or any psychoanalyst, is that the client can look at what you're working on. You know, he can be, the client, he or she, is part of it. It's not just this expert who's analyzing and I'm saying these things, but I don't know where I'm going or what we're doing. And, you know, there's formulation, okay? And the client's part of it. Using the content of formulations to understand the relationship between clients, various symptoms, and problems. Choosing starting points and methods of treatment and monitoring client reactions to these choices. You know, structure. You know, uh, it's a roadmap. You know, something you as a therapist and a client can look at. Am I getting better? You know, this is what I'm working on this week. Did I have any success this week? Yeah, yeah, I was able to. Uh, uh, well, I'd say um, dispute a cognitive distortion, and I felt better afterwards. Okay, made some progress. Keep doing that. It takes a lot of practice. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Where was I? Hmm. Fifth point down, yeah. Staying in the withdrawn position will have a number of important consequences for the depressed person. Um, so I put this, I want to put this up there because this will show why clients need a therapist, okay? Because they get stuck in these negative cycles, like Beck was saying. Firstly, the client is not likely to encounter experiences that might disconfirm her or his negative thoughts and beliefs. Therapist has to come in and, and, and disconfirm it. They're not going to be able to do it themselves. If you are depressed and you are overgeneralizing, and what's the other kind of distortion? I can't even think of any right now. Ah. And you are selective abstraction, and you have tunnel vision, you're not going to be able to do that yourself because your thinking is on one track. So you're just going to keep having these negative thoughts and beliefs and these kind of distortions. Okay. Secondly, staying on the withdrawn position is likely to lead to the client following a way of life uh, predicated on low levels of activity and greater lethargy. Okay. They're going to stay depressed. Thirdly, because the client is not going to out to meet the world, the world may well, after a time, stop coming to meet her or him, especially if her company is relatively unrewarding. So, I think I mentioned this in one of my videos about how, I, I can't remember which one, but it was like, who you are as a person, you structure your life that way. And the world, the world uh, modifies itself to you. If I'm depressed and I don't have any energy, and I don't talk to people. I don't go out. Well, I'm not going to do anything to get me out of my own depression. And then the world's going to, like, slowly close off on me, right? Because they're modifying 
the mo- the world's modifying to you. Okay, so I can't remember how I put it. I put it way better, but that's that kind of what Aaron Beck's talking about. Is you need cognitive therapy. You need a therapist to come in and help you, you know, um, break that cycle. And these are just a, a little bit of more about cognitive therapy. Cognitive therapy requires sound therapeutic relationship. Okay, we're probably it's probably not as sound as maybe Carl Rogers would want it, but it's definitely better than B.F. Skinner. <laughs> um, we we definitely we we want a therapeutic relationship because. Clients will, will will work with us. You know, we, we want to have a good relationship because we do care and we want we want you to get better. You know, we, we don't want you to be stuck with d- depression and anxiety and you know have anger issues. We want we want to see you become a better person and a better self and and become who you want to be. You know, but you gotta have a relationship uh, because it takes a lot of work, a lot of homework, a lot of assignments. Um, you got to open up and talk about things. And if you don't have a good relationship, you're not going to do any of those. So we, we require it. cognitive therapists stress the importance of collaboration. Again, you got to do, you got to put the work in. You're not going to get better unless you change. Uh, cognitive therapists, any therapist for that matter, they cannot reach inside your skull and change how you think and feel. You got to do it yourself. And well, I mean, we're, we're basically there to show you the door, but you got to walk through it um, every day multiple times a day until your automatic thinking is more helpful to you than harmful. Okay, Uh, Cognitive therapy is brief and time limited. Uh, It's structured and directional, which I like. I need structure. Not too structured where it has to be a certain way, you know, but something to look at, to uh, measure. You know, I like that. Cognitive therapy is problem and goal oriented. Okay. We do focus on the problem. Okay. We also focus on the goal. We're not like solution focused. That's just focused on solution. You know, you want to talk about your problem? Okay, you're gonna pay me either way, but I'm a solution focused, and we only need to be focusing on solution. You know, I did a video on solution focus. It's not that it, it's it's not so cold hearted. I I shouldn't say it like that, but I like solution focus too. Um, I don't think I'm hating on it. I, I, I do like them. But cognitive, cognitive therapy is problem and goal-oriented. Uh, cognitive therapy initially emphasizes the present time focus. We do like to talk about the past because it brings awareness to where this type of thinking came from. It's good to know for the client and for the therapist. You know, therapists can formulate uh, intervention based off the past. Um, so past is important. Um, and in the present, definitely the present definitely the present <laughs> that's probably the, the, the biggest one cognitive therapy uses the educational model cognitive therapists want to educate the client because they they have to do it on their own eventually okay the client has to do it on their own we're working ourselves out of the job and the only way to do that is to educate that person how interventions work how the mind works why they're thinking this way all that so we're trying to educate clients on you know they're thinking homework is a central feature which is kind of a drag because nobody wants to do it but you're only in therapy one hour a week that's not enough not for some serious cognitive restructuring you have to do it every day at home and you're gonna have in moment uh, uh, you're gonna have in moment to where you can like write things down and say okay this is what happened this is how I was thinking this is what I did you know it, it's gonna help you become more aware and build that metacognition this, um, so, so that you can get better so that's why homework is important a lot of people don't like it because it's called homework and they call it something else I think it is called something else but um, it's a drag to, to have to do homework but again it, it's it's part of that whole collaboration Cognitive therapists teach clients to evaluate and modify their thoughts. Cognitive therapy uses various methods to change cognitive content. Okay. Uh, is that it? That's it. Okay. I ended it already. So that was cognitive theory. Um, by 
Aaron Tebeck, the late Aaron Tebeck, uh, which I'm sad to see, uh, but, you know, 100 years old, he lived a long, good life. Uh, I'm glad that, you know, he was put on this earth. He, he was instrumental in me understanding um, psychology, and, uh, you know, I really appreciate his theory and what he's done. Um, so it's sad to, see, sad to see him, or sad to see that he passed away, but, you know, all... I guess it happens to everybody, right? So, um, I wish his family the best of luck. If you guys are watching this, I doubt you will, but uh, and, I, and I wish uh, you know a speedy grieving process and and uh, and everything. So, definitely use some of this cognitive theory if you're you know. Uh, well, that's not. I guess grieving is a normal process. So, anyway, I should probably get off. But uh, yeah, if, if if you have any questions, go ahead and hit me up um, on my email. If there's anything I missed, leave it in the comments. If I missed, messed up and maybe I described something that wasn't right, hey, let me know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still learning. I've been doing this since uh, 2008, but you know what? What I've learned is that the more, <laughs> the more you think you know, the less you, you realize you know. And there's always more to learn, and uh, so I'm, I'm willing to learn. Uh, but thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe. Uh, you have a good night. Thank you. Oh, wrong button. There we go. All right. Bye, everybody.